The research carried on in spite of an intrusion and a protest. And when the data came in, it showed that the GMO wheat did not repel aphid pests in the field as they had hypothesized and as they had observed in the lab. And in the two years we did the experiment, we couldn't see an effect. There was no difference between the control plants that weren't making the smell and the, 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 the plants that were, the engineered plants that were making the smell. That's why we need to do the field experiments to find out what happened there, because otherwise we could have been under the illusion that this would um, be a way of controlling the insects when, when really it wasn't. So we then thought about what were the reasons that it didn't um, translate into a, a field environment. And we, one of the reasons we think is that because the, the, uh, the gene switch, the thing that controls the gene, we had it permanently switched on in, in these plants. And we know that aphids respond to an on-off signal. So we now have a new hypothesis, and that is that if we can get genes in the plant that are switched on when the aphid attacks the plant, as the plant tries to defend itself, but not successfully, normally. But if we get those genes, they've got this sort of switch mechanism that we need for our genes. And so we can take it from those genes and attach it to our genes by some further genetic engineering. So now, instead of having it constitutively produced or produced all the time, it will only be produced when the aphid gets onto the plant and starts to use its mouth parts to try and get some sap from the plant. And that will then switch the genes on that make the alarm pheromone, which will come out of the plant more like it is when the aphid does it. Um, this is something that uh, most people that work in science and, and people that work in engineering for that matter um, are used to. So you, you start off with the hypothesis, you test whether, uh, whether that um, whether your hypothesis is, is correct, um, and then you learn from that. Well, uh, you, we have, have to, to stay ob objective as a scientist. That's, that's your job, is to evaluate something. You, you, you have a hypothesis, you gather the data, and, and, and you see whether your data fit the hypothesis. Our, our hypothesis was that we could reduce aphid populations by using this. The, the, the data didn't support that, and so we had to, to, you know, to, to um, go along with the scientific method and, 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 and say that's what we found. But we have learned things along the way. But um, obviously, part of my motivation of doing this project was the, the hope to find a, a new, um, more sustainable way of managing aphids in, in, in crops. And so, um, so naturally, it was, um, it, was, it, was, it was disappointing. But um, you know, I had to try and stay detached from that. And, and you, know, you need to stay objective as a scientist and truthfully gather your data and, 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 and go where, where the evidence um, leads you. Um, you decided to publish those data anyway. Yes. Why did you decide to publish data that um, were inconsistent with your hypothesis? Because it's important that people know the results of the experiment. Because if, um, if someone else comes along and wants to do the same thing, they need to know what, what we've already done so they're not reinventing the wheel. That's, that's important. But also, it's important for people to know the, the results, and that's what we said when we started this experiment, that, uh, that we wanted to find out whether it worked, and then, and then we would tell people whether it worked, and that's, that's what we do. So let's distinguish between an experiment that, that succeeds in forming a conclusion. So the experiment worked, it went to term, we, could, we, could, we saw the results, they were valid, and we could make a conclusion. And the conclusion was, in this case, the aphids weren't being repelled. And that's different from having an experiment that, that has a conclusion that you don't like. And, and this is what we had. We had an experiment that went to term, we concluded, and okay, it wasn't the conclusion that we wanted, that we hoped for, but it was an important conclusion because it's, it stops this whole process being repeated again if you can publish the results. So why do you think that the Wiffy Wheat case is such an elegant case to look at in terms of understanding how science really works? Because we've had scientific integrity all the way through the project, so we, we've we've haven't had any preconceived notion about what types of technology wouldn't wouldn't work, and um, we we did the experiment, we collected the data, and we reported the results completely truthfully on, on just reporting what we found. I think it, it shows it from from beginning to end, and, and shows the iterative um, way that um, that science works because. You, you start with a hypothesis, then, then you, you test that hypothesis. And 
and then you analyze the data and, and you look at it objectively and and then you learn from that and then you take that knowledge and that's your new knowledge that you start with and you build on to to start your the, the next part of the work and uh, and it's an important process those data informed the next hypothesis that the aphid repellent would need to be released by the plants in bursts rather than continuously the scientists are building on that knowledge today they're reworking the GMO wheat plant and the way that it expresses the repellent. The research continues to move forward with each experiment informing the next. Proactive and clear communication of these results has helped inform both the next steps taken at Rothamsted as well as informing the global scientific community. The spirit of openness and transparency, so evident at Rothamsted Research, helps to promote the public's understanding and appreciation of scientific research, as well as their trust in science. Perhaps someday, farmers will have access to GMO wheat that has an inherent ability to protect itself from the devastating effects of aphids. But for now, researchers at Rothamsted continue to grow our understanding of aphid plant interactions, the expression of genes in wheat, and the potential to use GMOs to control aphids in a manner that has less negative impact on the environment. No doubt this will be an interesting story in science to continue to watch unfold, step by step, with many scientists working on small pieces of this larger puzzle that eventually will fit together to explain how this particular area of science works.